On many New England town greens, statues honor the people who suffered through the bloody conflict of the Civil War. The monuments honor the shopkeepers, teachers, and boys from small family farms who fought for the Union. They commemorate the women who became abolitionists and nurses and learned to speak for freedom. They help Americans remember black people, both free and slave, who wanted full participation in the country they hoped the United States would become. At the time the Constitution is being written, the South exports a small quantity of black seed cotton that grows only on the Sea Islands off the coasts of Georgia and the Carolinas. Eli Whitney, a Yankee from New Haven, Connecticut, invents the cotton gin. The production and export of cotton quadruples in five years. The price of slaves doubles. Edmund Ruffin, a young agricultural agent in the South, witnesses a southern agricultural revolution sparked by Yankee ingenuity. Ruffin will fire the first shot of the war. At the same time, New England had this long tradition of commitment to freedom and, and individual rights, it was also the cotton textile manufacturing capital of the country. And cotton textiles depended heavily on raw cotton. Raw cotton was produced with slave labor. And so uh, New England was torn by its dependence on slave labor to produce the raw material that it needed for its industry and its commitment to human rights. Southerners grow rich on the backs of black slaves, and Northerners grow rich turning cheap Southern cotton into textiles. In New England, towns spring up around textile mills. The towns take their names from the mill owners, Lowell, Lawrence. Employment at the mills draws young people from New England farms and new immigrants, including many skilled textile workers. The mills represent financial opportunity, and their workers form the base of a free labor economy as New England industrializes. Even as the black hand picks the white cotton, slavery picks at the soul of New England. The New Englanders would preach to other people uh, that slavery was a sin and that they should cease sinning. Now, this did not go over very well with, uh, with Southerners who did not believe that slavery was a sin. And so you got this polarization in which Southerners and indeed a lot of Northerners who did not agree with this, with this theology, with this philosophy, with this reform mentality, regarded the abolitionists and especially the New England abolitionists as being self-righteous Puritan meddlers into the lives of other people. But that's not how the New Englanders saw it. They saw themselves as their brother's keeper. In the 1830s, William Lloyd Garrison, a Boston newspaper editor, publishes the first issue of his anti-slavery paper, The Liberator. In it, Garrison vows, I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. He, his stand on the question of uh, abolition and against slavery was as militant as you can imagine. You know, at, he, he argued that the Constitution of the United States protected the institution of slavery. And because the Constitution protected slavery, uh, he burned copies of the Constitution. He was uh, a person who was very, very popular among African Americans because he was one of the few white people in the country really speaking in favor of African American rights. When William Lloyd Garrison sought to establish the New England Anti-Slavery Society in 1831, he couldn't find a single place in Boston that would have given him a hall so he could have a meet. So he went to the African Meeting House, that is, today, up on Beacon Hill and Smith Court, the place which is now the African American Museum of Boston. He went to that church, and it was from the pulpit of that church that he organized the New England Anti-Slavery Society. It was from the pulpit of that church that Frederick Douglass stood and recruited troops for the 54th. So that just as in the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century, in the abolition movement, in the Underground Railroad, in the movement that geared the black community up for supporting the Civil War and the military effort of that war, it was the black church that was the heart and soul of all of those movements. Frederick Douglass, the son of a white man and an enslaved woman, is educated in black churches in Baltimore. He escapes slavery and settles in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he finds work as a ship's caulker for the whaling fleet. In New Bedford, he first hears William Lloyd Garrison speak 
With Garrison's help, Douglas becomes a leading abolitionist speaker. Frederick Douglass, May 6, 1845. In this land of liberty, I'm a slave. The 26 states that blaze forth on your flag proclaim a compact to return me to bondage if I run away and keep me in bondage if I submit. Wherever I go, under the aegis of liberty, there I'm a slave, chained in perpetual servitude. For free northern blacks, the 1850s are a dismal time. Congress passes a strong fugitive slave law, which allows slave catchers to hunt down and capture runaway slaves. The law also penalizes anyone who helps fugitive slaves. Senator Charles Sumner of Boston calls the fugitive slave law a result of the union of the Lords of the Lash and the Lords of the Loom. Amos A. Lawrence, whose father and uncle built the mills in the town bearing his name, leads the Cotton Whigs, who believe the concessions made to the South will protect the Union and resolve the slavery issue once and for all. In the North, despair and panic sweep over African Americans. 50,000 fugitives had found shelter above the Mason-Dixon line. Many had married free blacks. Now, None are safe. Thousands flee to Canada. For free blacks, a reign of terror begins. It becomes harder and harder for African Americans generally, and for lots of white people, to continue to buy this notion of non-violent resistance to the institution of slavery. Douglas changes during that period. He changes from a person who has uh, committed himself to the non-violence of William Lloyd Garrison to a person who is willing to use violence. When the fugitive slave law is passed and he's in Boston, he says, before a single slave is taken from this city, the streets of Boston will run red with blood. From Boston, Isabella Beecher writes to her sister detailing the abuses of the fugitive slave law. Isabella urges Harriet to buckle on her armor. The young women come from a family of dedicated abolitionists. Their father, Lyman Beecher, and brother, Henry Ward Beecher, are fiery congregational ministers. Harriet marries Calvin Stowe and moves from Litchfield, Connecticut, to Brunswick, Maine, where Calvin teaches at Bowdoin College. While attending services at the First Parish Church in Brunswick, Harriet has the inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin, she envisions Uncle Tom's death at the hands of Simon Legree for protecting fugitive slaves. Steal away, steal away, steal away. Tom heard the message with a forewarning heart, for he knew all the plan of the fugitives' escape and the place of their present concealment. He knew the deadly character of the man he had to deal with and his despotic power. But he felt strong in God to meet death rather than to betray the helpless. As he passed along the trees and bushes, the huts of servitude, the whole scene of his degradation seemed to whirl by him as the landscape by the Russian car. His soul throbbed, his home was in sight, and the hour of release seemed at hand. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a young instructor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College, sits in the pew across from Harriet Beecher Stowe and her family. Fifteen years later, he accepts the official Confederate infantry surrender in the small village of Appomattox Courthouse. Well, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a tremendously important book, sold millions of copies. The British Crown was considering closing the borders of Canada to fugitive slaves. But Uncle Tom's Cabin made such a splash, and especially among some of the nobility in Britain, that a decision was made to keep Canada open because slaves needed a refuge. And you know, the irony is that in the 19th century, for black people, the land of of uh, opportunity and the land of freedom was not the United States, it was, it was Canada. And so when they were escaping to freedom, they were escaping to this place that except for 
Uncle Tom's cabin might very well have been closed to them. An hour before daylight, Anthony Burns rises and makes his way to the Richmond, Virginia wharves, where he boards the vessel of a black sailor he has befriended. Burns hides below decks for three weeks, living on bread and water, as the ship sails toward Boston and freedom. There, with the help of abolitionists and other freed men, Anthony Burns finds work. In May 1854, two events happened. Uh, one of them localized in New England and the other national, that really uh, jolted a lot of people, and especially church members in the North, in a much more radically anti-slavery direction. One was the recapture of Anthony Burns. Anthony Burns was a Virginia slave who had escaped to Boston and lived there for several months. And under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Act, passed in 1850, he was recaptured by federal marshals and the whole city of Boston and indeed much of New England uh, resisted having this man taken back to slavery in Virginia. Reverend Thomas Wentworth Higginson from Worcester, Massachusetts leads a group of ardent abolitionists who storm the courthouse in attempt to rescue Anthony Burns. A federal marshal is shot and President Franklin Pierce sends in federal troops to keep peace in the city of Boston. Anthony Burns is remanded to the custody of his master and on the appointed day at the appointed hour he is going to be marched down State Street to Long Wharf where he's going to be put aboard a ship and taken back to Virginia. And so thousands of people line the street. 50,000 people show up and they have draped the shops along the route in black. And across State Street there's a coffin and it means liberty. And meanwhile, the federal government and the state government are just pouring troops in to try to keep these protesters back. The commanders have given the troops uh, orders that if the crowd breaks through the barriers, you're to shoot into the crowd. So this is a pretty serious situation. But finally, he is put aboard the ship and he is taken back to Virginia. Burns's market value is only $1,200. But returning Burns to his master costs the federal government $40,000. We rejoice, writes the Richmond Enquirer, but a few more such victories and the South is undone. Boston, of course, had the reputation for being one of the strongest bastions of uh, abolition in the whole country. And so if you could enforce the fugitive slave law in Boston, you could enforce it anyplace. And that's why it became really important for uh, the federal government to make sure that Burns was actually returned, that the fugitive slave law was actually enforced. From the standpoint of the Bostonian, the slave power was reaching its hand out from the South and plucking the rights of liberty from American citizens beyond its borders. At the same time, the same month, May 1854, Congress passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act which opened up territory north of the former 3630 line to the expansion of slavery uh, in, in Kansas. Uh, the combination of these two events, uh, which seemed to confirm what the abolitionists had been saying is that an aggressive slaveocracy, slave power as they called it, uh, controlled the United States government. That converted millions of people in the north to the idea that maybe the abolitionists were right. Merchants and retired men of State Street in Boston, the wealthy and powerful elite of the state are united against the bill. We went to bed one night, old-fashioned conservative compromise union Whigs, and have waked up stark mad abolitionists. Amos A. Lawrence. Amos Lawrence and Eli Thayer of Worcester, Massachusetts, found the Emigrant Aid Company. Its mission is to promote and help finance the immigration of New Englanders to Kansas. Thayer also recruits Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, head of the Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, and George Luther Stearns, a Boston philanthropist. Both men are dedicated abolitionists. Lawrence and Thayer hope to transplant the seed stock of New England values and institutions that will help keep Kansas free. On July 17, 1854, the first party of 29 immigrants leaves Boston 
singing one of the Lays of Emigrants, written by New England bard John Greenleaf Whittier. We crossed the prairie as of old, the pilgrims crossed the sea, to make the west as they the east, the homestead of the free. We go to rear a wall of men on freedom's southern line, and plant beside the cotton tree the rugged northern pine. The company quickly establishes a town in Kansas, naming it Lawrence, in honor of Amos Lawrence. America is having this big discussion about how to connect the Pacific coast to the Atlantic coast. After all, in 1850, California becomes a state. Uh, gold has been discovered in California. The fact is that people, lots of people, are interested in going west. So how do we make this connection? Well, the way we're going to make this connection is a transcontinental railroad. But here's the question. How does the transcontinental railroad travel? Does it travel a northern route or does it travel a southern route? Well, people like Stephen A. Douglas, who is a senator from Illinois, hopes very much that it's going to go through Chicago. And uh, that's the northern route. Well, in order for it to go through Chicago and beyond, there is the need to organize the territory of Kansas and Nebraska. So here it is. Slavery going to be allowed in these areas? The compromise that uh, Stephen A. Douglas worked out was to let the people decide there. It's the most democratic way you can think of. Let the people go out there and those people will decide whether they want to have slaves or whether they don't want to have slaves. But the problem is that some of those people came in from Missouri, a slaveholding state, and some of those people came in from western New York and, and New England, anti-slavery areas. And those forces, the forces of slavery and the forces of anti-slavery clashed in Kansas. You know, a lot of historians say that the Civil War began in Kansas. They don't call it bleeding Kansas for nothing. I mean, there were outright wars fought out there in Kansas. And of course, it is in Kansas that most Americans hear for the first time the name of John Brown. Dear Father, arrived in Kansas, her lovely prairies and wooded streams seemed to us indeed like a haven of rest, but now began to gather the dark clouds of war. An election for first territorial legislature had been held on the 30th of March of this year. On that day, the residents of Missouri along the borders came into Kansas by thousands and took forcible possession of the polls. Nearly a thousand Missourians arrived at Lawrence in wagons and on horseback, well armed with rifles, pistols, and bowie knives, and two pieces of cannon loaded with musket balls. Must the fertile prairies of Kansas through a struggle at arms be first secured to freedom before free men can sow and reap? If so, how poorly we were prepared for such work will be seen when I say that for arms. Five of us brothers had only two small squirrel rifles and one revolver. John Brown, Jr. One of John Brown's sons was one of those abolitionist settlers out there. And he sent back east and told his dad to come out and bring some weapons. So John gathered together some crates of Beecher's Bibles. Now Beecher's Bibles was a euphemism for Sharp's rifles manufactured here in Hartford, Connecticut. John Brown, an ardent abolitionist born in Torrington, Connecticut, believes that slavery is a sin against God. After receiving his son's letter, he raises money in New England and buys arms to take to his sons and the other free soilers. The Emigrant Aid Company finances John Brown's trip to Kansas. In May of 1856, violence erupts over the slavery question. Pro-slavery Missourians attack Lawrence, Kansas and burn the Free State Hotel to the ground. Along Pottawatomie Creek, John Brown and a small group, including two of his sons, retaliate by shooting and hacking to death five pro-slavery men. But none of these people were ever prosecuted for this in those days. John came back here to Collinsville and Hartford and gave lectures to raise money for his Kansas operations. During one of those times that he was here, after he gave a lecture here in Tiffany Hall in Collinsville, he was in the local drugstore chatting with some of the boys and uh, in walked the forge master of the Collins Company, Charles Blair. Brown pulled out 
a uh, kind of a dagger that he said he'd taken off one of those slave owners, Colonel Pate, and he asked Blair if he could make more of these with a hollow handle that you could put a long pole in. Why, sure, Blair said. Well, how much, says John. Well, for 500 about a dollar and a quarter apiece. John peeled off some money, and Blair set to work. John Brown returns to New England to raise more money. He hopes to begin a slave rebellion in Virginia that will spread across the slave states. Brown stops in Concord, Massachusetts, at the home of Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott's father. There he meets Frank Sanborn. Frank Sanborn was an educator here in Concord. He would go on to teach Annie Sullivan, who of course taught Helen Keller. Frank Sanborn, in the 1850s, was in Massachusetts as a member of a committee to make sure Kansas came into the Union as a free state. Frank Sanborn was completely enamored of John Brown, completely believed in everything he did, his methods. So Frank Sanborn said to John Brown, I can get you, gather you a group of wealthy New Englanders to um, back you, to give you financing while you're here in New England and to get arms and ammunition for you for whatever cause you have you know, coming up. And among these men that Frank Sanborn gathered were um, Reverend Theodore Parker, Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, and from Worcester, the pastor of the Worcester Free Church, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. And these men, with a few others, came to be known as John Brown's Secret Six. Brown also contacts George Luther Stearns. Stearns arranges to have the Massachusetts Kansas Committee turn over 200 rifles to Brown and pledges to buy Brown 200 Colt revolvers. The Federal Arsenal stands at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, at the verge of the Potomac and Shenandoah Rivers. The Appalachian Trail crosses there and will be the access route for southern slaves who join the rebellion. The pikes will be used by uneducated slaves, most of whom Brown believes cannot shoot guns even if they had them. John Brown bases his operations at the Kennedy Farm a few miles away. On Sunday morning, Brown assembles his 21 recruits, 16 whites and 5 blacks, for a final worship service. He prays to God to assist him in liberating slaves in that slaveholding land. On that moonless night, the small band descends into Harpers Ferry. A train pulls into the Harpers Ferry station. The train's baggage master, a free black named Hayward Shepherd, goes looking for the night watchman. One of the nervous raiders shoots him. The bell at the Lutheran church tolls an alarm. Townspeople armed with knives, squirrel rifles, and pitchforks begin to gather. By 11 o'clock on Monday morning, a battle rages at Harper's Ferry. The speed of the response completely surprises Brown. He sends his son Watson and Aaron Stevens to negotiate under a white flag. The townspeople, many of whom have been drinking all night, gun the raiders down. Bloodthirsty shouts of, kill them, kill them, ring through the armory yard. William Lehman, the youngest raider, loses his nerve and flees toward the Potomac. The crowd overtakes him and shoots him at point-blank range. All afternoon, the people of Harper's Ferry use Lehman's body for target practice as it drifts in the shallows of the river. Brown and his men were trapped in a building, and the governor of Virginia sent the Marines out there, and to command the Marines, an army colonel named Robert E. Lee. Remember, this was before the Civil War. Lee ordered the Marines to storm the so-called fort, that uh, the firehouse where Brown was. And the lieutenant that broke down the door stated later that when he slashed at the old man with his dress saber, he was warded off by a spear, which could only have been a John Brown Pike. Lee sent his lieutenant, J.E.B. Stewart, Jeb Stewart, later Confederate General, 
out to the Kennedy farm to see what kind of evidence he could find. And he found plenty. There were all kinds of papers, receipts, and so on, from, the, from Charles Blair, not the Collins Company, but Charles Blair, and from many of his backers in the Boston area. Stewart found about 500 pikes still at the farm. At least one or two were used by William Lloyd Garrison, the famous abolitionist, to emphasize the fact that this whole business of slavery would require force to overcome. On the other side, Edmund Ruffin, the ardent firebrand of the South, the man who pulled the lanyard for the first shot on Fort Sumter, got 15 of these. And he displayed them to the Southern congressmen, and then he sent a pike to each of the Southern governors with a little card or a little statement written on the handle. These are the favors those Northern Northerners have in store for us. At this point, the forces in the South who have been pushing for secession gain an upper hand because John Brown's raid makes a very important point, and that is, we're not safe. That is, that there are people in the North, and some of those people powerful and wealthy, who are willing to support invasion of the South, and who are willing to support the efforts to encourage slave uprisings. And of course, that was, that just caused all kinds of fear in the South. The state of Virginia quickly puts Brown on trial. Amos Lawrence writes to the Virginia governor, Henry Wise, describing the old man as a Puritan whose mind has become disordered by hardship and illness. Lawrence warns Governor Wise that a sudden execution will horrify the North and that from Brown's blood would spring an army of martyrs all eager to die in the cause of human liberty. Despite Lawrence's pleas, after a hasty trial, Brown is sentenced to death and scheduled to hang. On the way to the gallows, John Brown passes his final message to the sheriff. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I think I vainly flattered myself that without much bloodshed it might be done. Hanging of John Brown, December 1859. Frank Leslie's newspaper report by Dr. Rowlings. The scaffold was erected at 7 a.m. So lovely a day we have never witnessed in December. It was a pure autumn sunshine day. The dome on the courthouse and the various roofs of the building of the city shone brightly. The soldiers' swords, bayonets and arms glistened like new burnished steel. The hour of eleven had arrived. The jail door opens, cool, collected, calm, almost indifferent. John Brown comes forth to meet his doom. He smiles around, he admires the country. He enters the military lines. He approaches the scaffold, he ascends the step, he stands upon the drop. And then, a slight noise, a fall of a foot, a straightening of the limbs, and John Brown had suffered the penalty of the law. A group of dramatic characters assembles for the events at Harper's Ferry and John Brown's hanging in Charlestown. J.E.B. Stewart and Major Thomas J. Jackson of the Virginia Military Institute support the Marines, commanded by Colonel Robert E. Lee. Edmund Ruffin, the agricultural expert, comes to witness the execution. 21-year-old John Wilkes Booth of the Richmond Grays Militia helps guard Brown against an abolitionist rescue attempt. An aspiring actor, Booth gives dramatic readings from Shakespeare at the Charlestown Episcopal Reading Room. The actors are now come to the stage. The play is about to begin. In March of 1860, Abraham Lincoln, the Republican presidential candidate, makes his only campaign tour through New England. 
he visits his son Robert at the Phillips Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. On the way, Lincoln gives a rousing speech at the Cooper Union in New York City. Republican leaders ask him to deliver the speech again on a whistle-stop tour through New England. March 4, 1860. Dear Mary, when I wrote you before, I was just starting on a little speech-making tour. Tomorrow I bid farewell to the boys, go to Hartford, Connecticut, and speak there in the evening. Tuesday at Meriden, Wednesday at New Haven, and Thursday at Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Kiss the dear boys for me. Affectionately, Father. Gideon Wells, the editor of the Hartford Evening Press and the Connecticut organizer for the Republican Party, greets Lincoln in Hartford. The presidential campaign of 1860 is the most important election in this country since the adoption of the federal constitution. The declaration of our independence is scouted and its meaning pettifogged into obscurity. It is the high mission of the Republican Party to restore honesty and purity to the administration. Gideon Wells. The Wide Awakes, a new Republican organization started in Hartford, escort the candidate to Turo Hall. March 5th, 1860, Hartford, Connecticut. Look at the magnitude of this subject. About one-sixth of the whole population of the United States are slaves. We think slavery a great moral wrong. And while we do not claim the right to touch it where it exists, we wish to treat it as a wrong in the territories where our votes will reach it. Let us have faith that right makes might and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. When the Civil War starts, Abraham Lincoln makes clear that what he wants to do is to preserve the Union. He offers a kind of compromise to the South. He says that he is willing to support a constitutional amendment, which ironically would have been the 13th Amendment, that would have guaranteed the right of slaveholders in the South to hold slaves forever. What he was not willing to do is to allow slavery to spread into the Western territories. Now the reason for that is complex, but the simple way of saying it is that Americans saw their future in the territories. And so to allow slavery to take root in the territories would be allowing slavery to take root in the American future. I think Americans, white Americans were willing to accept slavery in the American present and in the American past but I don't think that they were willing to see slavery become the foundation of the labor system for the American future. That, in the North, Americans wanted to see the foundation of America's future in free labor. Lincoln wins the November election. 1,500 men march in a wide awake victory parade past the old state house in Hartford. Newspapers all over Connecticut take up the cry, Wells for Cabinet. In the Deep South, feelings against remaining in the Union run strong after the Lincoln victory. On December 20th, 1860, delegates to a state convention in South Carolina vote to secede from the Union. Soon, six more Southern states join South Carolina. They establish a new nation, the Confederate States of America. The Confederates elect Jefferson Davis of Mississippi president. In Washington, James Buchanan begins to think of himself as the last president of the United States. From the standpoint of the South, secession was about protecting that institution which was at the core of what, was, what Southerners referred to as the Southern way of life. Now, the South wasn't all about slavery, but slavery was integral to almost everything that identified the South as a, as a particular region. Um, the South was about agriculture, but slavery provided the labor for the agriculture. The South was about states' rights and, and wanting 
to protect its ability to act independent of the federal government in ways that were best for the institutions and the people within their state. But when they talked about states' rights, they talked about the right of the state to protect the institution of slavery. So that slavery becomes central to most of the things that the Southerners referred to as the Southern way of life. Business owners in New England panic, fearing the disruption of their financial relationship with the South. An economic depression sets in. In the month of January alone, 60 firms in Massachusetts fail. Business leaders in Boston push to create a union compromise. Amos Lawrence warns his Southern friends that if anyone in the South strikes a blow against the government, the whole North will unite against them. On March 4, 1861, in a climate of defiance and disunity, Lincoln takes the oath of office. He appoints Gideon Wells, the Hartford newspaper editor, the 24th Secretary of the Navy. Many of the naval officers in Washington and about the Navy Department are of questionable fidelity. A number have already resigned and most of those who were tainted with secessions left the service. There was a very general and very determined opinion that Fort Sumter ought to be, and should, be reinforced. Major Anderson and all the officers of the garrison expressed in a measure the professional opinion that reinforcements could not be thrown into the fort in time for their relief without a force of less than 20,000 good and well-disciplined men. The president then, and until decisive steps were finally taken, was averse to offensive measures and anxious to avoid them. Edmund Ruffin, the fiery pro-slavery secessionist, arrives in South Carolina with a symbolic Collins Company pike. He fires the first shot in the bombardment of Fort Sumter. The Union troops surrender quickly, and the Confederates raise the stars and bars over Fort Sumter. President Lincoln retaliates by announcing a blockade of the Confederate coast from Texas to South Carolina. Gideon Wells turns his attention to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Maryland, of course, where Annapolis is located, had divided loyalties. It was a border state, and culturally it was connected with the South, and a good proportion of its people sympathized with uh, the issues involved in the Civil War, secession and slavery. And um, it looked like uh, the Naval Academy was in trouble. These people were going to raid the school and try to take away the training ship. And, and the principal training ship there was the USS Constitution. It would have been a tremendous morale booster if it had gone south. The man who came up with the idea to move it to Narragansett Bay was George Blake. He was a native New Englander. Now, why Narragansett Bay? Narragansett Bay has many assets. It's the deepest. Uh, natural harbor on the East Coast, and it has numerous places for uh, locating anchorages. And he represented this to Secretary of the Navy Gideon, Gideon Wells, and he says, okay, go there. The Naval Academy is quickly moved to Newport, Rhode Island. Many of the Southern students leave the Academy and return to their home states to serve in the Confederate Navy. When the Naval Academy finally came up here, it only came up with 156 students. And because the Navy was in dire need of officers, by the time it was here in Newport for two weeks, there were only 76 students left. The Union needs sailors and soldiers. Washington, D.C. is in jeopardy, and Lincoln needs troops to protect the capital. He asks the New England states to raise regiments. Right after uh, Fort Sumter had been fired on, Abraham Lincoln sent a telegram to the governor of Vermont, Erastus Fairbanks. And Lincoln simply asked, what may we expect of Vermont? Fairbanks replied uh, with a sentence of one, one word longer. Vermont will do its full duty. And I think by the time the whole thing had ended, a little more than four years later, you could say that Vermont had indeed done that. In Tunbridge, a small farming community in Vermont, Wilbur Fisk hears the news of war. Wilbur Fisk, 
Tunbridge, Vermont. I was in the post office with some other young men to inquire for news. The postmaster is an aged man. He said with almost tears in his eyes, the war has begun. I was in hopes that something could have been done to prevent it. And he spoke as if he felt there was an awful calamity brooding over the nation. We boys who loved excitement did not take to it so seriously as he did. No, we were ready to shout hurrah, because now there would be a chance to teach the South a lesson. But we didn't realize how much it would cost us to teach it. In 1861, Wilbur Fisk enlists in Company E of the 2nd Vermont Volunteers. That summer, the nation's best-known marksman, Hiram Burdan of New York, convinces the War Department that the Union Army needs sharpshooters. William Frank Tilson, like many Vermont boys, has hunted squirrel from early childhood. He passes the sharpshooting test by putting 10 consecutive shots inside the 10-inch ring at a distance of 300 yards. 620 of Vermont's finest marksmen join the sharpshooters. I'd say one of my greatest uh, collecting prizes was the uh, frock coat of a Berdan sharpshooter, uh, William F. Tilson of the uh, Second United States Sharpshooters, the only one known in private hands. Uh, Tilson was wounded nine times during the war, so it's a very historic piece. There were only a few regiments that wore dark green coats during the Civil War. Generally, most of the federal troops wore the dark blue, but this was a green, it was designed to be uh, an early form of camouflage, and very few of these survived. They were such a, such a hard fighting unit, and they lost so many men that virtually most of these coats were used up and didn't survive the war. Berdan's sharpshooters originally started out with uh, Colt revolving rifles, and they weren't really that happy with them, and they were quickly traded in for the double set trigger sharps rifles, which they were very happy with. They were great guns, and Berdan's did a lot of damage. Berdan's often claimed that they killed more Confederates than any other Union regiment. This is arguably the best gun of the Civil War. It's a Spencer carbine, and it works by a very unique feeder tube in the back. This is a feeder tube that holds seven shots. You put that in, put the first shell in your chamber, and you can fire seven times. The Confederates called this the gun that you loaded on Sunday and fired all week. Practically all of the breech loading arms and the repeaters were made in New England. Um, New England had the machine shops and the expertise to make these guns. The Collins Company in Canton redirects its axe, plow, and edge tool business to make weapons for officers and mounted troops, as well as socket and saber bayonets. The Hazard Powder Company of Enfield produces more than 12 tons of powder for small arms and cannon. Only three Union vessels are available for blockade duty, so Gideon Wells calls for arming hundreds of mercantile vessels to enforce the naval blockade of the South. In the shipyards of New England, from Bath, Maine, to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, to Mystic, Connecticut, shipbuilders respond, converting the mercantile fleet to ships of war. On November 7, 1861, the Union Navy bombards Confederate fortifications guarding the harbor of Port Royal on the South Carolina coast. The harbor offers an excellent base for the northern blockade. Union forces take Port Royal and the entire string of coastal islands between Savannah and Charleston, an area famous for its production of Sea Island cotton. As Union troops advance, Slave owners abandon their plantations and flee to the mainland. They leave 10,000 slaves and cotton growing in the fields. The 3rd New Hampshire Volunteers take possession of the islands. Henry Moore, a young conquered photographer, chronicles their time there. Reverend James Manning from the Old South Church in Boston 
organizes missionaries to the Sea Islands. Clerks, doctors, divinity students, professors and teachers, underground railway agents and socialists, driven by New England zeal, go to the Sea Islands to teach freed slaves and their children. In the spirit of the free soilers in Kansas, the volunteers are ready to engage in another battle between freedom and slavery. The Confederates have retrofitted the Merrimack as an ironclad in the Norfolk Navy Yard and rechristened it the Virginia. On March 6, 1862, the Merrimack runs the gauntlet of the Union artillery on the banks of the James River and on March 8th, easily sinks the sailing frigates Cumberland and Congress. The ship withdraws when darkness falls. The next morning, the Confederate ironclad is met by what looks like a Yankee cheese box on a raft, the USS Monitor. Charles Burr, a young sailor from Meriden, Connecticut, is the gunner aboard the Monitor. We sailed down the bay and soon sighted the Merrimack. Drawing near, we opened fire on her, and she returned shot for shot. For hours, we sent shot and shell at each other, but with no effect. At about five o'clock in the afternoon, the Merrimack withdrew. And set down in history, you'll find the monitor declared the victor, but of that I am not sure. No one was killed on either side. The 35 of us who were on board the monitor prayed for darkness that the battle might cease for a time. We were terribly tired and were glad it was over. Charles Burr. The battle between these ironclads confirms that the day of the sailing warship is over. The Union blockade holds. By 1862, the value of southern cotton exports to England falls from 100 million to 4 million dollars. At the first Congregational Church in Madison, Samuel Fisk, the minister, finishes his Sunday sermon and marches out with the congregation to join the boys of the 14th Connecticut Volunteers who are leaving for the war. His pregnant wife and young son go to live with her parents. Fisk chronicles his experiences in the army under the name Dunn Brown and sends his letters to the Springfield Republic. Dun Brown Goes to War, August 23, 1862. My dear brother, I stood it just as long as I possibly could and then caved in, got a year's vacation from my people and went to recruiting, got a squad of some 25 men from Guilford and came in as a second lieutenant under Captain Bronson of the Foot Rifles 14th Regiment to start in a few days, probably for the seat of war. Old Connecticut is finally rousing up. We in the reserve are coming down to help you who are in the advance. We are in a great hurry making out our muster roll, and so I cannot write you at much length. God bless you and keep you. Your affectionate brother, Samuel Fisk. In Brunswick, Maine, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the young professor of rhetoric and modern languages at Bowdoin College, applies to Governor Israel Washburn of Maine for a commission. Washburn appoints Chamberlain a lieutenant colonel of the 20th Maine Volunteers. The Stowe household is in a state of confusion about the war. Fred Stowe, Harriet's son, responds to Lincoln's call for volunteers by dropping out of medical school and enlisting in the Union Army. Publicly, Harriet rejoices that young men embrace the cause as a bride and are ready to die for it. Privately, she prays with Fred and tries to prepare herself for the worst. The war has come like a whirlwind, amazing even those who had foretold a bitter harvest of violence. Julia Ward Howe is a Boston poet married to Samuel Gridley Howe, one of John Brown's secret six. When asked to write different words to the tune of John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, Mrs. Howe replies, I have often wished to do so. One morning, as she lies in bed waiting for the dawn, the words come to her. 
Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The finished poem is published in February of 1862, and the battle hymn of the Republic becomes one of the most enduring songs of the Civil War. On September 17, 1862, the Battle of Antietam takes place. General George McClellan catches Confederate forces, led by General Robert E. Lee, near Sharpsburg, Maryland. It is one of the bloodiest days of the war. Another soldier writes home, Hartford Daily Times, September 29, 1862. The Battle of Antietam was severe all the first day with cannon. The shot came like rain, round shot, shells, shrapnel, grape and all. Four captains of our regiment were shot down at once. It was the greatest battle ever fought in America. My coat was shot through and through and 16 balls passed through my clothes. I shall send my coat to Hartford that my friends can see how it is riddled. Mark Nesmer, 16th Connecticut Volunteers. September 19th, 1862. To A.N. Clark, Dear Sir, I have just finished burying those of our regiment who were killed in the fight on Wednesday, and I lose no time in giving you the list. I give you also a description of the locality in which we place the dead, in order that their friends might find their bodies if they wish. There is a road running about due east from Sharpsburg to Stone Bridge across Antietam Creek for the possession of which hard fighting took place in the morning. The bodies lie near a large tree standing alone and which I had blazed on all sides so that it can be easily discovered. The battle has no clear winner. Lee withdraws to Virginia. McClellan's massive peninsula campaign against Richmond fails and President Lincoln calls for 300,000 more volunteers. Men, men, send us men, they scream, or the cause of the Union is gone. Why does the government reject the Negro? Frederick Douglass. Wilbur Fisk, 16th Vermont Volunteers. The boys think it is their duty to put down the rebellion and nothing more, and they view the abolition of slavery in the present time as saddling so much additional labor upon them before the present great work is accomplished. Negro prejudice is as strong here as anywhere, and most of the boys would think it a humiliating compromise to the dignity of their work to have it declared that the object of their services was to free the repulsive creatures from slavery and raise the Negro to an equality with themselves. I verily believe if such a declaration was made today, a majority would be inclined to lay down their arms and quit the service in disgust. McClellan's failure to capture General Lee after the Battle of Antietam frustrates Lincoln. He replaces McClellan with Major General Ambrose Burnside. Burnside attacks the entrenched Confederate forces at Fredericksburg, Virginia. Dunn Brown on the battlefield, Fredericksburg, December 15, 1862. Connecticut 14th Volunteers. Oh, Republican. Another tremendous, terrible, murderous butchery of brave men had made Saturday, the 13th of December, a memorable day in the annals of this war. On Friday, Fredericksburg was taken with comparatively little trouble and loss. On Saturday, the Grand Army Corps of Sumner marched up against the heights back of the city, where the enemy lay behind strong fortifications, all bristling with cannon and protected by rifle pits, while our men must cross a wide space of clear open ground and then a canal whose every crossing was swept by artillery so perfectly trained beforehand that every discharge mowed down whole ranks of men. Into this grand semicircle of death, our divisions marched with rapid and unflinching step. The wounded were mainly brought off, though hundreds were killed in the benevolent task. The city is filled with the pieces of brave men who went whole into the conflict. Every basement and floor is covered with the pools of blood. Limbs in many houses lie in heaps, and surgeons are exhausted with their trying labor. Every 15 minutes we had a person on the table until we dropped, until you ended up and you couldn't open your hands anymore. Most likely if a man loses an arm or leg, he'll never get married, because he won't be able to support a wife. You have farmers and millwrights and people coming in here. You work with your hands, your back, and your legs. 
When they're burned out, nobody's going to say, hey, I'll pay you to stay home. Because Lister's theory on sterilization came out in 1867. And a lot of doctors in the 1880s and 1890s committed suicide when they realized all they had to do was wash their hands. It wasn't because the doctors were uncaring and didn't know about you can't put filth into a wound. They tried to keep them clean, but water was precious. You've got 10,000 to 100,000 men camped in one area. Anything that's like water is sucked dry immediately. It was very hard to come by. We reused bandages because we were thrifty New Englanders. Cloth costs money. You're not going to throw it away. Good Lord, it's so it's got blood on it. It's going to get more blood on it. There they were, our brave boys, as the paper justly called them. For cowards could hardly have been so riddled by shot and shell, so torn and shattered, nor have borne suffering for which we have no name. In they came, some on stretchers, some in men's arms, some feebly staggering along, propped on rude crutches, and one lay stark and still with covered face, as a comrade gave his name to be recorded before they carried him away to the dead house. The sight of several stretchers, each with its legless, armless, or desperately wounded occupant, entering my ward, admonished me that I was there to work, not to wonder or weep, so I corked my feelings and returned to the path of duty which was rather a hard road to travel just then. Louisa May Alcott. What she got out of being a Civil War nurse was one of her first great successes. It was a book called Hospital Sketches. It was a compilation of letters and stories that she had written during her time as a Civil War nurse. It initially began as a serial in local newspapers, which is, I think, the way the soldiers most likely would have gotten it. And by the time the war was over, it was actually in book form. And it has been reprinted as all of Louisa's writings numerous, numerous times. And I think it also shows the strength of women during that time of the country's history and how strong they were, women like Clara Barton and the other nurses who were so prominent in New England. Wilbur Fisk, Vermont Brigade, picketing in Camp Griffin, Virginia, 1862. The veil of night has now shrouded everything in gloom. No sound charms the ear, nor sights greet the eye, nothing but dull vacancy. At such time, how natural for the mind to revert to the pleasant homes that we have left behind. We almost fancy we can see the family circle gathered round the fireside and hear them speaking of the absent one and wondering if he is picketing this cold night. Thought of parents, brothers and sisters and of kind friends at home will throng upon our memory and picture glowing anticipations of the time when the rebellion shall be crushed and we'd be permitted to return home and greet them face to face. Oh, for freedom. Oh, freedom. You know, the war starts oh, out as a war to protect the Union. But when he issues the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, he transforms that war from a war to save the Union to a war dedicated to the destruction of slavery. Now, the war had always been about slavery, but it hadn't been officially announced as a war about slavery. Part of the reason is because in the North, it is not clear that most Northern whites would have supported an American war against slavery. But when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, refocusing the war squarely on the institution of slavery. Um, it made it a holy war. Lincoln publicly calls for the recruitment of blacks. He authorizes Governor John Andrew of Massachusetts to raise a regiment of black soldiers to be called the Massachusetts 54th Volunteers. Robert Gould Shaw, from a family of staunch abolitionists, becomes commander. Frederick Douglass and other prominent free black men recruit for the 54th, drawing blacks from across the country into the Massachusetts regiment. His own sons, Lewis and Charles, are among the first to respond. I urge you to fly to arms and smite with death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. We can get at the throat of treason and slavery through the state of Massachusetts. On the night of July 18, 1863, 
the 54th Massachusetts leads the assault on Fort Wagner, a nearly impregnable earthwork stretching across Morris Island. They are really, in some ways, on a suicidal mission. I mean, there have been white troops that have done this uh, days before, and they've been cut down. And these African-American troops are doing this in large part to make the point, yes, we are willing to fight and die for the cause. And our cause is freedom, our cause is the United States, and our cause is the dignity of our race. On the morning of July 19th, the rebels bury 600 Union soldiers in the sands before Fort Wagner, including the commander, Robert Gould Shaw. A contemptuous Confederate commander buries Shaw with his black soldiers. The burial is intended to humiliate Boston abolitionists. During the war, 38,000 black soldiers die to save the Republic and put an end to slavery. President Lincoln issues a proclamation warning that if the Confederates mistreat, sell, or enslave any prisoner because of color, the Union will retaliate against Confederate prisoners. Prisoner exchanges stop until the Confederacy agrees to include blacks, but it takes the better part of a year to establish that policy. On July 1st, 1863, in the farm fields surrounding the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, a chance encounter between Union and Confederate forces becomes the pivotal battle of the Civil War. The Union troops are outnumbered and surprised. On the second day of battle, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and the 20th Maine Volunteers are ordered to hold the left flank of Little Round Top at every hazard. We were assigned to the extreme left of our line of battle, where the fiercest assault was made. A whole rebel brigade was opposed to our regiment charging on us with desperate fury, so that we had to contend with a front of fresh troops after each struggle. After two hours fighting in the defensive, our loss had been so great, and the remaining men so much exhausted, having fired all our 60 rounds and all the cartridges we could gather from the scattered bodies of the fallen around us, friend and foe. I saw no way left to take the offensive, and accordingly, we charged for the enemy, trying cold steel on them. The result was we drove them entirely out of the field, killing and wounding 150 of them and taking 308 prisoners and 275 stands of arms. They admitted that they had charged on us with a brigade and said that they had fought a dozen battles and never had been stopped before. J.L. Chamberlain, Colonel, 20th Maine. At the end of the battle, the Union flag carried by the 20th Maine Volunteers still stands on Little Round Top. After three days of bloody fighting, the Confederate troops retreat. General George Meade and the Army of the Potomac win the battle, but fail to follow Lee as he retreats back to Virginia. When the guns stop after three days of shooting, the carnage is almost inconceivable. Fifty-one thousand men are dead, wounded, or missing. Fred Stowe, Harriet Beecher Stowe's son, is in the cemetery, the very central point of the battle, when fifty-two shells a minute explode around the troops. A piece of shell strikes him and enters his ear, he is sent to a hospital in Washington. A year later, the wound has not healed and still causes him intense headaches. My dear Fred, you may imagine the anxiety with which we waited for news from you after the battle. The first we heard was on Monday morning from the paper that you were wounded in the head. Do get someone to write for you and tell us how to direct and what we shall do for you. God bless you. At last you have helped win a glorious victory. The cause is triumphant. God be thanked. Your loving mother, Harriet Beecher Stowe. There was a serenade last night in honor of the success of our arms at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, and led everywhere to spontaneous gatherings, firing of guns, ringing of bells, and general 
gratification and gladness. The Potomac is swollen by the late heavy rains and the passage of the rebel army is rendered impossible for days. They are short of ammunition. In the meantime, our generals should not lose their opportunity. Providence favors them. Want of celerity, however, had been one of the infirmities of some of our generals in all this war. Gideon Wells. As early as 1861, Lincoln defines the Civil War as essentially a people's contest in which the South, by seceding, threatens the survival of a government founded on democratic ideals. In the fall of 1863, he dedicates a national cemetery for the men who fell at the Battle of Gettysburg. There, Lincoln reaffirms his ideal of a government conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Despite Union victories in Vicksburg and Gettysburg, the war seems to drag on and on. On April 20th, the Confederates capture most of the 16th Connecticut Volunteers in Plymouth, North Carolina. To keep their flag from the enemy, the men tear it into small pieces. Each man hides a piece of the flag on himself. The Connecticut 16th Volunteers are sent to a prison in Andersonville, Georgia. Robert Kellogg of the 16th Connecticut Volunteers begins a diary when he enters the prison. Robert Kellogg, 16th Connecticut Volunteers, Andersonville Prison. As we entered Andersonville Prison, a spectacle met our eyes that almost froze our blood with horror and made our hearts fail within us. Before us were forms that once had been active and erect, stalwart men, now nothing but mere walking skeletons and covered with filth and vermin. The policy of the Confederate authorities respecting us seemed to be to unfit as many as possible for future service. And to secure the object more speedily, they cut down the rations to half the usual quantity. Live worms crawled upon the bacon given us to eat. It's all right, we said. We are nothing but Yankee prisoners. Or as the rebels usually speak of us, damned Yankees. In May of 1864, General Ulysses S. Grant, promoted to commander of the Union armies, develops plans to engage Lee's forces in Virginia until he destroys the South. Yankees and rebels meet and fight the three-day battle of the wilderness. May 3rd, 1864. Dunn Brown's advice, Camp on the Rapidan, Virginia. Dear Republican, these great and terrible battles that are to decide this opening campaign probably bring the war to an end. These coming successes, we devoutly hope, are to atone for the disgraceful reverses our arms have this spring sustained in every quarter where they have been engaged. Oh, for the power to speak a word that might thrill the breast of every Union soldier and rouse him in that holy enthusiasm for our right cause. It should make every blow struck irresistible and carry our arms victorious right into the citadel of rebellion and conquer a right peace. For God and freedom throughout the world, yours truly, Don Brown. On May 6th, the second day of the wilderness campaign, a bullet strikes Captain Samuel Fisk in the chest. He dies of his wounds. In Madison, Connecticut, Fisk's wife and congregation mourn. Springfield Republican, May 28, 1864. Our Dunn Brown died at Fredericksburg, Virginia, on Sunday of wounds received in the wilderness battles. Our readers all knew him, and they all loved him and no words of ours can add to the brave record of his life or take away the pang that his death occasions. In June of 1864, General Grant attacks Confederate forces at Cold Harbor, losing more than 7,000 men in 20 minutes. Wilbur Fisk, Vermont Regiment, 1864. The most singular and obstinate fighting that I have seen during the war or ever heard or dreamed of in my life was the fight of last Thursday. Hancock had charged and driven the enemy from the breastworks and from their camps, but the enemy rallied and regained all but the first line of works, and in one place they got a portion of that. The rebels were on one side of the breastworks, and we on the other. We could touch their guns with ours, 
they would load, jump up and fire into us. And we did the same thing to them. And every shot that was made took effect. Some of our boys would jump clear up onto the breastworks and fire, then down, reload again, then fire again, until they themselves were picked off. This firing was kept up all day and until five o'clock in the next morning. I went and visited the place the next morning. And though I have seen horrid sights since this war commenced, I never saw anything half so bad as that. Our men lay piled one on top of the other, nearly all shot right through the head. And there were many among them that I knew well, five from my own company. On the rebel side, it was even worse than on ours. In some places there were men were piled four and five deep, some of whom were still alive and kicking. God, oh, I turned away from that place, glad to escape from such a terrible, sickening sight. I have sometimes hoped that if I must die while I am a soldier, I should prefer to die on to the battlefield. But after looking at such a scene, one cannot help turning away and saying any death but that. Robert Kellogg, Andersonville Prison. When we first entered the prison, we thought the time would not be long that we should have to stay, and we tried to pass the time away as pleasantly as possible. Fine, clear evenings, we would gather together and sing. But now everybody looks so careworn, and the boys moved about quietly and sadly. It was surprising also to see how many of the men were victims of insanity. Those who had become so in that place, we could scarcely call anything less than a hell upon earth. D.S. Birdsell of Hartford, Connecticut went into the hospital just before I left. Upon his entrance, he told me he thought death was doing its work, and every feature of his countenance was marked with sadness as he said it, for he had a wife and children that would mourn his loss. Tears filled his eyes as he thought of them, and how desirable it would be if he could only spend his last days with them. It was a struggle for nature to yield, and he said, It's hard to die here. I'd hope to die at home and how much that word means to a soldier and a prisoner, especially to one that sees his days are to be almost numbered. He gave me his diary and pictures to have in charge until I could send them to his family, and bade me tell them of his love and remembrance in his last days, far away from them. Toward evening, I walked up by the large prison gates, and there lay ten dead men ready to be carried out for burial. They were to be taken just as they were, placed in an army wagon, one up in the other until it was filled and driven off to a place of burial, like so many animals, without a coffin or even a winding sheet. Then they were to be placed side by side in long, shallow trenches, a few boards placed over them, a covering of earth thrown in, and the burial of the Patriot was ended. We could but sigh for these thus passing to their graves, unwept, unlamented, and unhonored. Surely a nation's pity and a nation's gratitude must be stirred at sight of these countless sacrifices upon her altars. Then, too, as the intelligence should find its way back to many a home in northern vale or hillside, to the hamlets on the western prairies, or those among the rugged slopes of the east, there would be loving hearts that would mourn, and many tears would be shed in memory of the silent sleepers in southern graves. These are troubled times, the fall of, of 64 for the Confederacy. Richmond and Petersburg under siege, and Atlanta's falling, uh, fallen in the, there have been the defeats in the valley, and uh, desperate measures are called for, dramatic measures. And these Confederate prisoners who had escaped uh, from a camp around Chicago, a bunch of them, make their way through Canada up to Montreal, where there was a hotbed of Confederate activity up there, pro-Confederate activity, a Confederate cell up there, as it was called. And they decide to try to rob the St. Albans banks. The leader was a young man named Bennett Young, a Kentuckian, uh, who passed himself off around St. Albans as a theology student. In early afternoon, they emerged from their hotel, some of them apparently in Confederate uniforms, all of them armed, and proceed to rob the three banks in town. And when they go into those banks, they don't just ask for the money, they also say that they're doing this to make up for the depredations that Sheridan is now causing in the Shenandoah Valley. See, the burning is going on here, you see. They emerge from the banks. While this is going on, some of their compadres are herding townspeople into Taylor Park over here. <laughs> 
School children get a look at this from the school buildings. Word gets around fast that a lot of the locals run home and grab their rifles. The Confederates pull from their saddlebags grenades, primitive grenades, some filled with something they call Greek fire. And they tell the bankers their intent is to burn this town to the ground. This was war. This was serious. There's been, a, there's been some levity about the St. Albans Raid over the years, you know. And the raiders gallop north out of town with 208,000 Yankee dollars. One of the interesting sidelights to this whole thing is that at almost precisely the moment that those Confederates emerge onto the street to begin what we Vermonters consider dirty work, 550 miles to the south and slightly to the west, Sheridan was about to launch the great counterattack that turned Cedar Creek from that great Confederate victory that Lincoln so feared into the great Union victory that it became. You'll have to call St. Albans, I fear, the Confederate victory, but it certainly pales in comparison to the tremendous drubbing that Sheridan gives to Jubal Early on the high fields above Cedar Creek. A great coincidence and an extraordinary day in the history of Vermont. The Confederate lines around Petersburg and Richmond collapse. On April 2nd, 1865, Lee evacuates Richmond, the Confederate capital. April 5th, 1865. We get no particulars of the surrender of Richmond, of the losses and the casualties of the time and circumstances of the evacuation. On Sunday, Lee sent word to Davis that they were doomed and advised his immediate departure. With heavy hearts and light luggage, the leaders left at once. Gideon Wells. On April 9, 1865, General Ulysses S. Grant chooses Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain of the 20th Maine to formally accept the surrender of Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. At Appomattox Courthouse, as the defeated Southern troops march past, Chamberlain orders the Northern soldiers into the old marching salute, carry arms, as a gesture of respect. More than 600,000 men Yankees and rebels have died. In Virginia, Edmund Ruffin, who fired the first shot on Fort Sumter, commits suicide rather than pledge allegiance to the Union. He leaves a final letter. I here declare my unmitigated hatred to Yankee rule, to all political, social, and business connections with the Yankees and to the Yankee race. Would that I could impress these sentiments in their full force on every living Southerner and bequeath them to every one yet to be born. April 14th, 1865. Last night there was a general illumination in Washington. Fireworks. Today is the anniversary of the surrender of Sumter and the flag is to be raised by General Anderson. The president remarked that he had last night the usual dream which he had preceding nearly every great and important event of the war. The dream itself was always the same. I inquired what this remarkable dream might be. He said it related to my element, the water, and that he seemed to be in some singular indescribable vessel and that he was moving with great rapidity toward the indefinite shore. That he had this dream preceding Sumter, Bull Run, Antietam, Gettysburg, Stone River, Vicksburg. I had, the President remarked, this strange dream again last night, and we shall, judging from the past, have great news very soon. President Lincoln attends a performance of Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. John Wilkes Booth, a Maryland actor who gave readings of Shakespeare while waiting for John Brown to hang, 
shoots the president. April 15, 1865. The president had been carried across the street from the theater to the house of a Mr. Peterson. The president lay extended on a bed, breathing heavily. The night was dark, cloudy, and damp. And about six, it began to rain. A little before seven, his wife made her last visit to him. Robert, his son, stood with several others at the head of the bed. He bore himself well, but on two occasions gave way to overpowering grief and sobbed aloud, turning his head and leaning on the shoulder of Senator Sumner. The respiration of the president became suspended at intervals and at last entirely ceased at 22 past seven. In June of 1865, the captain of the Confederate privateer Shenandoah fires the last shot of the war. Unaware of the Confederate surrender, he burns 10 New Bedford, Massachusetts whalers in the Bering Sea. The New England whaling fleet never recovers from the Civil War. The new Congress convenes, and the members vote to return the Naval Academy to Maryland. The control of Congress was taken over by Midwestern Republicans. They made the argument that it didn't set too well to have the two military academies both in the North, West Point in New York, and then the Naval Academy in New England. They didn't want anything to go too far south. If Maryland would, would pass an emancipation resolution, it, it could get the Naval Academy back, and that's what it did. By the slimmest of margins, the state legislature passed a resolution abolishing slavery. Didn't have to do it, you know. The Emancipation Proclamation was a federal proclamation. Each state had to endorse it. And Maryland did it in order to get the Naval Academy back. By the end of the war, the South is in shambles. Southern slave owners and poor whites resent both Yankees and former slaves. Four million black people who have known nothing but slavery face hostility throughout the South. They have no support, no land, no education, and no way to earn their bread. A way of life has ended, and no one knows what will replace it. What is to be the future of the colored people of this country? Some change in their condition seems to be looked for by thoughtful men everywhere. But what that change will be, no one yet has been able with certainty to predict. Frederick Douglass. After the war, Robert Kellogg and the surviving men of the 16th Connecticut return home and put their torn pieces of flag together. At the Grand Flag Day Parade in 1886, they march under the memorial arch that commemorates the 4,000 Hartford men who served the Union Army and Navy. Their flag resides with the other regimental flags in the state capital in Hartford. Joshua Chamberlain returns to Brunswick, Maine, where he first heard Harriet Beecher Stowe read excerpts of Uncle Tom's Cabin. He is elected governor four times and becomes the president of Bowdoin College. Fred Stowe, still suffering from head wounds, becomes a drunkard. He writes his mother, did I only think of my own comfort, I would kill myself and end it all. But I know that you and all the family would feel the disgrace such an end would bring upon you. Stowe sails around Cape Horn to San Francisco and disappears. Wilbur Fisk returns to his home in Tunbridge, Vermont. Wilbur Fisk, Tunbridge, Vermont, July 26th, 1865. Home at last. The second Vermont regiment was not paid off till yesterday. Now that most of the boys are home and have become citizens instead of soldiers of the United States, 
our old regiment no longer exists as an organization among the powers that be, but must henceforth be reckoned as amongst the powers that were. There have been great changes in our ranks since their organization four long years ago, and so, too, we find among these hills and valleys great changes have occurred among the inhabitants with whom we used to delight to mingle. Some have removed to other places, but many have gone, alas, to return no more. How well I remember my parents' anxiety when we parted four years ago. But since then, they have followed two of their children to the grave, while their soldier son still lives. Here are the same hills and the same fields that we saw then, but they have passed into other hands, and somehow there seems a loneliness in contemplating them, which forces the impression that this world cannot be an abiding place. To look back upon the campaigns of the peninsula, of Maryland, of the wilderness, Shenandoah Valley and others, it seems almost impossible that all the events which our recollection can recall should come within the range of four years. A lifetime of experience has been crowded into this fierce term of war. If I was asked how it seemed to be a free citizen once more, I should say it seemed as if I had been through a long dark tunnel and had just got into daylight once more.